Awesome to welcome Golden State Warriors assistant coach Dayan Milovic to the basketball podcast. After his 2009 retirement from a very successful professional career, Milovic became a head coach for Mega Basket of the Adriatic Basketball Association. There he coached future NBA All-Star and NBA MVP Nikolai Jokic. In the 2015-16 season, he coached Mega to their first ever trophy, the Serbian Cup, as well as their first ABA League Finals appearance. In 2021, he won the Montenegrin League and Montenegrin Cup titles with Bucharest. In addition to club coaching, Milovic had a coaching stint with the Serbian national team from December 2019 until September 2021 as an assistant coach. Dayan, welcome to the podcast. Uh, gl- glad to be here with you. I'm really excited. I'm excited. So many places we can go with this conversation. And uh, why not start with the league MVP, uh, Nikola Jokic, uh, a friend of mine with the Denver Nuggets and assistant coach Charles Class asked him a little bit about you. And his quote was, the most positive and optimistic person there is truly makes you believe you're more than capable. <laughs> what, what a quote. And uh, let's dive into that, coach. What makes you that person? That's a beautiful quote. <laughs> so thank, thank, really, you know, big thanks to my friend Doggy. Uh, you can you can always choose what your view about not just basketball but life would be like. We can find negative things in anything, literally anything, you know. And and I I choose not to do that. <laughs> so you know, I, I'm le- really try to teach my players and not just my players to you know any person around me to you know think about positive things and i believe if you think positive that then positive things will happen well it's great and uh, there's no doubt with his path that was really important because him believing in himself seemed to be a big part of his process wasn't it uh, i'm not sure that he believed in himself from the, from the very beginning you know it, it was it was not uh, easy uh, to convince young players i, I got him uh, in, in his you know really uh, young age when he didn't turn 18 he was 17 when uh, first time you know we, we, we start working and uh, he was playing in professional league so my job back then was uh, to persuade my players to believe that we can beat mature pro teams and we were really successful you know we had you know, many good games even my team was uh, made of guys 17, 18, 19, 20. We had only one older guy most of the time. Everybody else was really young kids. And if they don't believe that they are better than they really is, it's hard <laughs> to, to win any games. There. And we were pretty successful. We had in my, I was in Mega. We are talking about the Mega basket. I was over there for eight years as a head coach and two years in some weird role as well, like assistant coach uh, and GM all together, but but that, that was my my very beginning. And after I was head coach for eight years, and we managed even to win a title, to play one finals in in, in the league and several cup finals, and to to win one cup. So you know, with such a young team uh, playing against pro teams, some Euroleague teams, Red Star, Partizan in, in this league. Uh, I think it's a really big success, you know, to, to to win something. A really big success. And to put that in perspective for people, the goal of Mega was more development, right? Because it, it was an agent, agent-owned club, which is a little unique in the focus of development when you're competing against some of these teams, as you said, that were trying to compete at the EuroLeague and beyond, right? So winning at that level was actually extra special, wasn't it? Yeah. And, and you know, like... When we say focus is focus is on development, yes, it is, but it's all together. Uh, you cannot develop if you don't play hard and try to win games, <laughs> because because you know you cannot say player, okay, just go and play and, and have fun without any responsibility. This is not development. If you want to develop player who gonna be successful and he gonna win something, he has to have responsibility. Yeah, he has to have freedom. And he has to have freedom to make mistakes, but making mistakes, uh, right one. That's that's. It's not just doing any mistake. Any mistake, if you repeat, and it's uh, stupid try. Like you cannot try stupid things. If you try good thing, and and even if make mistake, that doesn't matter. You know, you have to you know try to play basketball how you should be played. Unselfish, aggressive. You know, and giving your best. 
I love that. I love that you connected that for us. And, uh, you know, Jokic also mentioned that uh, you, you trained all skills to all players. And we can see that in his development, obviously. And he also mentioned that you rotated positions where everyone is a de facto point guard. Is, it, was that a part of your philosophy from a very early age in coaching? Uh, I was uh, mad. This is the best word. When I realized that, that players doesn't learn sets, uh, as a set, like they just learn what they sh- should do on their position, like go there, go there, and they d- they don't have a clue. I'm, I'm not saying all players, but some of the players, they were learning sets like just for their position. I go over there, I set the screen, I do this, and that's it. And uh, for me, playing set and running set, all, all players should know what is the goal and what is the point of the set. So you should know uh, movement for any position, uh, on the court doesn't matter if you're playing big you should know what your point guard is doing so on the practices I was mixing players on each position to you know for me to check do they really know uh, uh, set and, and position and you know it was really fun uh, moving them and the game uh, began getting so better flow that you know there is so many situations in in, in, in basketball game that because of defense and def- defensive pressure, then you lose the, the flow. And then if players know what is continuation, what should do, it's easier to fix it and, you know, to just keep keep playing. And for me, the key thing for successful success of some offense is what you do and what is your continuation when defense break your initial idea. And, and that's what we were doing a lot of. I think that's that's really key, not just on a level when you play with the kids. I was doing this whenever I was, you know, coaching every team, you know, trying in, in, in you know, Euro Cup team, auditions when I was coaching after, you know, and I was assistant to national team and I'm, I'm trying even to help with this here in Warriors. Well, and the play after the play is what we call that. And that's that's such an important part of the game. And you're on record in many of your interviews talking about connecting skills and decisions and the fact that, you know, skills are important, but what is extremely important is decision making. So can you give us a perspective on how you approach that and how you train some of those things? For me, skills are just small piece that you should, you know, the player should be able to do whatever he think of. But really development really is decision making and there is some players uh really uh good players doing great players that are not so skillful like they have skills on, on the things that they're doing but you know if they want to you know go uh and try some some crazy things they, they cannot do it but they they do functional things and for me uh, sometimes it's even better to know less <laughs> in in some situations, you know, because some players, and especially when they're young, uh, they want to show off and they they try so many crazy things. And the hardest thing is to play simple. And even now, for if we talk about Nikola, and we are obviously talking now, uh, yeah, he's doing so many great things. But majority, like eighty percent of things things that he's doing are fundamentals, <laughs> and then. He can build up on that. So, and some players they they try to start with hard things and to you know you know avoid fundamentals, some easy buckets, some easy passes, simple passes, you know, simple decisions. So, like majority has to be simple decisions, and then you know you build up on that. Depends how good player you are. And, and the, the trickiest part is obviously implementing those into the game. Right. It's it's great. You can do it in practice. But how do we get them to transfer it to the game more easily? Uh, first, like if we're just talking now about the player development, then I'm going to talk because, you know, I am uh, I'm not development coach. <laughs> you know, I am I am coach, head coach that is now assistant. And my job is, you know, even in Warriors, my job is assistant, you know, being being involved in offense and defense. But I know to do development development of bigs is my specialty and you know beside Jokic I was working with many good bigs and I'm working now in Warriors with, with you know great bigs and that but that just like by, by part but I think it's connected like you cannot do good development because you have to figure out what are you good at and 
how they're going to implement it in a game. And for me, every player is unique. And that's how you should approach two players. For example, Jokic has one set of skills and things what he can do on the court. I was coaching like Zubac, he's a different player. So, okay, let's figure out what he can do. Marjanovic, Boban, okay, different. What he can do. Uh, Goga Bitadze from, from Indiana, yeah, what he can do. Now, Looney, okay, let's see, Loon, what you can do and, you know, what, what's going to make you better than others. But, but you know, you cannot just copy-paste things and, and try, you know, uh, Jokic thing to do Looney. Yeah, some things like fundamentals, you know, yeah, you can do with any player. But I'm talking about the... Uh, type of the game that player is playing, it has to be fit. Every, even even now, if we are talking now about the bigs, look at the all uh, bigs in NBA. Let's say NBA, but we can talk about world basketball uh, equally. Look at all uh, bigs, like best of the best. For example, if you compare Karim, Shaquille, uh, Hakim, you know, now Jokic, are are they different? Yes, they're very different. And Will, I don't know, I'm, I'm going to forget some Sabonis before or whatever. And, and they're, they're different. They don't do the same things, you know. So they have their own unique set of skills. So like if you're developing them, you should see what is their fit and try to, you know, maximize the things that they're good at. And plus to add one or two or three things on the side. But, you know, if you're... Uh, uh, you, you're a great player, you have to do fundamentals. What, what, what that means? You have to have finishing both sides and you have to be decent passer when you're a double team because if you're not a good passer, you're going to struggle after. If you're talking about off offensive skills. And then, you know, you have to, you know, see when you say finishing, finishing can be very different. Like, you know, and, and if you talk about low post game, there is no low post game now, like maybe like 10% of of the game, but doesn't matter. Like you can do so many things now out of pick and roll, rolling, diving, and then you know finishing out of it. So, so there is so many things that you can work on, and not to be copy paste. Copy paste are some fundamentals. So how you receive the ball, what is your uh, position when you get the ball, uh, what, what is your like? I, I like to speak with the players. What are their steps? I think you have to when you get the ball, you have to have what is your primary thing to do in the moment when you get the ball. And then if defense doesn't allow you that, then what is your reaction on that? So like you have to have the goals. What is your primary action when you get the ball in which situation? And I think it can be practiced all together. It's, you know, trying to uh, development is simple. If we talk about development, what is development? In my opinion, you try to replicate what is happening on a game and try to practice this and try to, find solution, what is the best one in, in the in the situation when you get the ball? So, so it's like you replicate the game situations in a practice. So I'm really trying to do as much as I can with any player on a situation that is going to happen to him on a game. Simple. It really simple. is that simple, right? And yeah. uh, I, I want to get your I, thoughts. I, I, uh, no, coach, I want to get your thoughts on this. Um, developing passing you mentioned already. Okay. Do we overemphasize the actual fundamental, the biomechanical skill of developing passing versus the importance of developing the decision? Because ultimately, the decision makes the application of the skill more important, doesn't it? And more effective. Of course, like, but it's all together. If you don't know, and, and believe me, I was getting a pro players that are that they doesn't know fundamentally easy passing, like you know how you pass. So you first learn how you pass. And then it's about decisions. And for example, like, okay, when you get a ball, let's ima imagine a picture, you're getting a ball out of short roll. And then you know that you have to pass in a corner when there is rotation. But the way there is several passes, are you going to pass inside head, outside head, overhead pass? And like, this can be, you know, worked on. And uh, I think that, that, you know, Altogether, anticipation is really important. The feedback from the player, because not any player is fit for any pass. Mm -hmm. so, so, like, not any player is fit for every shot. <laughs> because you, you cannot. Some players are not good at floaters. Like, floater is, for me, great shot if you're good at that. But some players are not good. And it's not a fit. Even if, if you try to work 
uh, on that they don't feel comfortable with with uh, shooting floaters. So, okay, then let we're gonna do something else. So yeah, uh, decision making is like seventy percent, and thirty percent is you know fundamentals. Because if you know what you're gonna do, you're gonna figure out even without so. Uh, so, so great, like textbook fundamentals. And and so what I'm hearing you basically say is that ultimately it's the players problem solving or their solution that's more important than ours. And that we may come in with our ideas that says, hey, try this, this, and this, but ultimately the one that they choose is the best one for them. Is that right? I agree. And, and then we can discuss with them why they pick this to, to help us figure out like maybe in a future development why some player is picking this because I like to have explanation for everything that we're doing, what we're doing on the court and what players are doing on the court. And what is the best uh, thing for that is that you get the feedback from the players. And that's why I really have open uh, relationship with the players and not just now as, as assistants. Usually assistants are closer than head coaches. I was like this when I was a head coach for 10 years previous, I, I think that you have to uh, be, it's my way, my way of coaching. You know, the, the, the nice thing about coaching is there is no only way you have to do this. We, all, we are all unique, like players are unique and coaches are unique also. So uh, you have to figure out what is the best fit for you. And for me, the best fit is to be really straight, open with the players, having a relationship where, where you know, they are, open enough to tell me what it, what they're feeling on something is. And then, then you know, if you connect this with everything in a game, I think this is the best what you can do. Well, and the best fit applies to team systems as well. When you talk about Golden State, we all love how Golden State plays. Coach, yes. can everyone play like Golden State? Of course no. <laughs> of, of course no. Like, it has to be fit. Like, Golden yeah. State has... You know, personnel that is fit to the game that we are playing. And we as coaches, we try to maximize that to, you know, take the best out of the players that we have. But, you know, you can replicate some things of our game, but you cannot replicate our game. Well, let's say what are some of those things? So if you were to take pieces from the Golden State system uh, that you could apply to any system, what are some of those things? Extra pass, drive kick swing, you know, the things that we, that we are doing yet, I think they're fit forever. It, it depends which kind of basketball you like. I understand if some teams have, have like dominant dominant guy who is really great at one-on-one, whatever, but, you know, yeah, still you can play with extra passes. And, and I, I think that if you play this unselfish basketball and move the ball, that more players are happy and if more players are happy, there is really better chemistry in the team. And when the bad moments came, it's easier to, you know, overcome that. So as a coach, we should care about players enjoying the experience? <laughs> or, I, I, I think, you know, it, it's, it, it really should. Because, you know, basketball is a game. Yeah, it's, a, it's, it's uh, you know, a job also. But first has to be fun and you have and you to enjoy a game and me as a coach, I, I enjoy my job really. And, and yeah, there is hard moments, but if there is not hard moments, then you sh you wouldn't enjoy the the good moments. <laughs> so it's it's a, it's always a balance. So so I think that uh, enjoying game, coach and, and player is really crucial uh, for long term. So um, back to back to Jokic a little bit. Like you talked about his development, that he was very quick to transfer things from practice to games. Now, what is the case, and how do you approach it when a player maybe struggles with that process? Is it just a case of more repetitions, more game-like scenarios? How do we speed up their transfer from practice to games? First, we have to analyze why is transfer not happening. For example, maybe I'm trying something that is not the perfect fit for him. Like, okay, do, looking good, you know, when you play without defense, looking good one-on-one -on -one defense, but when you transfer it to five-on-five, five, you know, it, it doesn't look good. So why? Let's let's analyze why is that happening. So let's see what is his first thought in a moment when he gets a ball and then you should think she, he should do something and he, 
things ob obviously different. But uh, I, I'm trying to analyze what is his, th his thoughts. And then if I see that he's really thinking of, of, of that, but he just cannot execute, then it's about more repetitions. And if you are uh, trying on a practice to put him in a situation that you want as you know as much as, as you can, I think it's it's easier to do because you you try to replicate five on five on practice also. So let's try to do development five on five also, just, not just one on one or two or two or three or three. I think the, the bigger group is more realistic. And, and that makes sense. And um, I'll give you an example. I mean, there's some video of you working out with James Wiseman on on YouTube. And it's a case of basically from the looks of it, there's a progression. Obviously, he may do it one on oh, then he do may do it guided versus you some type of guided defense. And then I'm assuming you move it from these repetitions of block practice to more random, and then you're putting them in game situations. And then the game situations is ultimately where it transfers and connects. Is that is that a, a realistic progression? Yeah, so, so, something like that. But, you know, the things that I was doing with Wiseman uh, when he was injured is not that, that he, he going to do that exactly on a games like we, we try yes like left hooks that we were doing he gonna he gonna do and he start doing and getting better in that and but the point is at the moment of his rehab we uh try to do the best that we could and when the player cannot run and jump there is limited things that you can do so like you know you can work on you know his his shooting and, and you know his passing and, and then his hook and i think we really improved in in all those things, you know, now when he's healthy, uh, uh, there is so many nice things that we can do and, and we're going to do. He's really great kid. He is trying to, to do whatever we are telling to him. And I really have no doubt that, you know, he's going to become a really, really good player because uh, when you have this athleticism that he has with you know, work ethic and, and that he's really good and coachable kid. I don't see that, that, you know, long-term uh, this wouldn't pay off. It's very cool. It's very cool. It's going to be fun to watch that. And, uh, you know, back to your head coaching role. And now, as you said, I love that your mindset is you're a head coach who's an assistant, right? And that approach. And I love that approach because it's absolutely true. When you were a head coach, you referenced this, that whatever the drill, we are competing. That in competing was an important part of it. And uh, can you talk about some of the different ways that you included competition within your practices? This is what Nikola Jokic ta taught me, <laughs> you know, uh, I was beginner coach and then I got him after my second season, I think. And then I saw that the, the guy, Nicola, is whenever we do some competitive drill, he's really trying hard. And whenever we do some repetition drill, you know, you want to kill him at the moment. <laughs> how bad, how how bad he's behaving. And like now you have approach, like trying to push him to do harder the things that he doesn't like or to try to make to try to make the the things that you want to do but competitive and to make him work harder and i tried to do this like I, I was thinking because i was a player before like would i like to do more competitive drills or just repet repetitive drills answer was like, competitive so okay let's let's do what you you would love to do <laughs> so, so we try literally every everything to compete even now when i'm doing with the development like when we practice shooting there is no just let's shoot it's always i try to set some goals okay make this amount of shot of this amount of shots you know like you always try to compete with yourself and it's more fun and you can see the progress because for example if you're shooting and you make 50 shots out of 100, and then you make 60, you make 70, you can see a progress. If you just shoot and you don't count, there's there it, it just, you know, uh, uh, it doesn't it doesn't level up like, like when you're counting. Well, I love this. And, uh, you know, what we now know is kind of a constraints-led approach. You were using this in the sense that you were changing the context of the same drill by adjusting one small detail. For example, 
the scoring system, right? Can you give us an example of that? Yes, and, and uh, for example, I was changing the drills, even that the, uh, are not fitable to a game. I'm going to be uh, really spe specific. There is many drills that we were doing because some coaches before us did it. Try to copy paste things, and then we think of like. Why I'm doing this? <laughs> so I'm trying to do uh, things that they're going to happen in a game. So many coaches, I'm going to be specific, are doing, uh, you, you know, five-man weave, three-man weave, real venue. So do I'm we there have, with you, coach. <laughs> yeah, and so do we have situations when you pass to the guy and run behind his back? No, there is no situations in a game. So why are we doing this? So and there is so many drills like this, that's, you know, like you just did it because somebody before did it and, you know, you learn when you went to coaching school or when you were a player, you see what ex-coaches were doing. And then you see why I'm doing this. So I I really cut the, the, all the drills that are not fit to the game that I'm, I'm playing. So, for example, you practice pick and roll game and you try to, to help from a two-man side, okay? And then some coaches, they put pick and roll drill on three on three or four on four. So when you do this drill in three on three or four on four, do you have two men side to help? No. So why would I do this if it's not a fit what we're going to do in a game? So I try really to, you know, many drills I can talk about, but I, I've tried to, you know, all drills that are competitive and that, that are fit into my game that I want to play. Well, I couldn't agree more. On, yeah, I couldn't agree more. Like three man weave, for example, is just fluff, takes away time from actually learning things that transfer to the game. And there's no decisions, which is, as we know, is <laughs> this mi mindless practice does not connect for you, I'm sure, in your philosophy. Yeah, exactly. And for example, let's do, let's say, drill three on two, two on one. And I was doing before, like, you know, two players are waiting for three men's coming. And then you say, when this happened in the game? Like, you know, usually the everybody's running back. So it's like, let's try to replicate that. So now when I'm doing this drill, I'm trying to do it that is game fit. <laughs> Not like, you know, before. Yeah, those three on two, two on one drills are way too scripted and organized. And that's not how transition happens for the offense or the defense, does it? That's what I'm saying. <laughs> yeah. And, 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 you know, like you can do this if you want to script decisions, but to do this always, it's it's pointless in my opinion. You said in this uh, one article, you said sometimes the winners, the group that successfully defended most of the attacks, sometimes the ones who made the largest number of stops, or you can decide that an offensive rebound removes a point from the opposing team score. And all I'm trying to give is some examples of you're doing the exact same, maybe three on three, small side game, but just by manipulating those things, you emphasize something different, right? Yes, like, and there are so many things with a just simple thing what you're working on. Like, if you wanna, if you wanna put a point to boxing out, whatever you play five five on five, you put a counting, and then you say like, okay, but every offensive rebound is a point like you score, like you add point or you take take the point of opponent team, just to put the more pressure of boxing out and not allowing offense. You can do this on turnovers if you want. You can do on many things. I never try to do this on turnovers personally, but I know that, that you can, because if you put a pressure on turnovers, usually then people struggle in decisions and it shouldn't be like that. Yeah, there should be responsibility, but you know, you have to play free. You have to play free. I love that. And uh, you can see that in uh, some of your players and some of your teams, I'm sure. And uh, mentioning some of the work you're doing too with Golden State, one of the articles references a lot of the work you're doing on rebounding. So if you don't mind, let's dive into that a little bit because the first belief is that we can teach a player to be a better rebounder, can't we? Of course. Well, uh, it's easier with the bigs like, than the guards because there are situations – uh, with the guards that when they are in position to defend transition. So like, and some coaches has have coaching philosophy that, you know, run back, don't go on offensive rebound, just defend transition. So it's hard to improve rebounding. I'm talking about offensive rebounding in the situation like this, if you're a guard, but if you're, you can improve, of course, uh, defensive rebounding. And that, that, that is applicable to everyone. If you talk about big men, again, you, you should see, which kind of big you are, like uh, now, you, you know, in Warriors, I have Looney and, and, and Wiseman, and they're different. <laughs> so, so the things 
should be a bit different even in, in rebounding, but the things should be same in some things. And like I, I was telling Loni this season, for example, he's not super vertical and he's not super big, right? But when you go into contact with the bigs, they cannot jump. <laughs> so like, so you take them, their advantage. And now, because he is really strong guy and great in the contact, and he improved his feeling. So like how, how you can improve your feeling? Uh, literally, I figured out that many players are not looking at the ball when the ball is shooting. So then you have really small time to react if you're not looking at the ball if you're looking at the rim so you have just a you know, split of second to react and to grab a ball but if you are looking at the ball then you can anticipate is it hard shot is it short shot so you can relocate according to that and this can be practiced also with a proper boxing out and with a proper boxing out I, I don't like the old school boxing out it's hard for me now to explain uh, you because I'm sitting <laughs> and, and I cannot explain it. It's, it's explainable on a court. But if you box out in a way that I'm teaching my player, like a sideways with one hand free, like you're not you turning your back as much as you're teeing up the player, right? More of a shoulder to chest type of box. Yes. Out, right? yes, 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 yes. And then, you know, like you're controlling them more, you're stronger in the position. One hand is free that you can grab the ball and you're tougher. So like it's, it's, uh, all, all together with proper boxing out, the, the the contact, the looking at the ball, and knowing where to position. So all together, the improvement was, was there. And it's not just Loon. I can, I can say that all the bigs that I was coaching through my career was decent rebounders. And, you know, like, like in everything, you can teach player up to some level. And then above it is his talent. It's his reaction. Like, we are talking about the passing. You, I, 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 I can teach player to pass properly, but to be Jokic passer, no. Jokic passing is Jokic. <laughs> and, and yeah, like you can uh, open his vision and tell him you should do this, you should do that to improve that. But still, it's going to be his talent and his creativity. So like, what are coaches? We are just the helpers. We help. We are helpers, and we try to help players to. Uh, maximize their, their potential, and if we succeed, that that the, you know one of best things and, and best feelings for me. Like when you see that somebody is uh, doing things that you, tr you, you, you you that you try to help him with, you know, it makes me really happy. Well, and it comes back to what you've said already, like in the context that we're helpers, maybe you give them three possibilities and then help them determine which one of those three is the best for them, right? Exactly, and then. Let's change it if, if it's not working. <laughs> so I, I'm, I, I was never like a guy who is stick to some things. Like some players are, you know, doing different things. And, and it's good at that. Like, for example, again, I'm going to be specific. Like coaches, when you st start teaching passing, you say, oh, no, overhead passes. This is and especially jumping overhead pass. Mm -hmm. Then you're seeing now Luka and Jokic and many players really great on that. So should we say, hey, don't do this? No, we say, great. <laughs> you know, it's because they're great at that. And, and then you should emphasize. But I think that you cannot teach that type of passing everybody. So like the, the, the coaching job is anticipation now. And, and like it's way different than before. For example, like 30 years ago when I started playing, the coaches didn't have so many informations like we had. So now, literally on internet, you can find anything that you want about basketball. So many lectures, so many things. But what is coaching now? You have to anticipate what is the fit for your team. Because you cannot say, hey, I want to play like Golden State if you don't have Golden State players. You have to see what is the perfect fit for your team. And that's what makes coaching now good and bad. So um, what you're saying about passing, I just want to come back to that. So the idea being that we limit too many possibilities early on. Yes. The initial part should be to allow possibilities and then only take them away if the player can't handle them, right? Beautiful stuff. That, that's exactly what I'm trying to do. Like open things, you know, offer everything and then see what they're good at, what they're not, and then to limit things on, a, on, on the things that they're good at.
And to me, that is modern coaching. That is the approach of modern coaches is to not go in and tell them what they need to learn, but to give them all possibilities. Going further, you talked about finding the right fit for your team. Let's talk about play formations or something like that. What are some things that dictate that in your opinion, when a coach now is listening and saying, how do I determine what's the best fit for my team? First, what what kind of bigs do you have and what kind of point guards do you you have? So like, this is for me, the two most important positions. Why? Uh, For example, big determines what kind of defense you play. Because if you don't have a big who can switch or who can hedge or who can, you know, protect the rim, then you cannot do, do these things. You have to see what your big man can do defensively and then to, you know, fit everybody else around your bigs. And then point guard is about offense, like what he determines. So, but, and not just point guard. Now we have, we have players with multiple positions, but for example, if we don't have good pick and roll players, then we have to play a bit different than just simple pick and roll game. And then if you have good pick and roll players, like, I don't know, Chris Paul, then there is one type of game. And, and that, that that is a fit. So you cannot imagine if you try to, Make Chris Paul not playing pick and roll and try to run, running, you know, some say it, he 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 can do this like, but he wouldn't be the best uh, like like he is now, you know, one of the best pick and roll players in the league. Yeah, the best oh. version of himself, right? And that's where you, what you're really trying to say is you're trying to maximize the best version of your best players. Exactly, and then like for example, depends what kind of force you have. Like if you have four men who stretch, then you can play. You know, stretch basketball. If you don't have, if you have two non-shooters, then the spacing in offense is different. Like it should be different spacing. You cannot play, you know, uh, five out if you if you don't have a shooter for that. So like that's what I'm saying. Like person, you 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 see your personnel, and then you see what is the best fit for you. Yeah, but uh, I guess generally gone are the days when we would just plug a player into our system. Right, and now we're adapting to the player and constantly adapting to our players. I think it's a, just what is y- your coaching philosophy. My philosophy is always from my very beginning to fit for the players' capabilities. Like I had in my almost ten years in in in, in as a head coach, very different pigments, and I was playing different basketball almost every other season. Like because in in, in mega. Their young kids are, you know, maturing and going to, you know, NBA or EuroLeague or wherever. So then it, there is another player is coming. So you have to change the game according to this player. And I was doing that. Like my first season, I had Boba Marjanovic. So I play like 40 minutes on because, because in Europe, you know, you are allowed to be, you know, uh, inside the paint and it's the zone is uh, easier fit for the big man like Boban is. And, and then like, Nicola came with Nicola. I play many things because, you know, he can even really even switch, you know, he can do his smart player. He can, he can do his better defensively than, than most people think. And then after, you know, I, I had Goga Bitadze, who is, who is now in Indiana. He was really, you know, good rim protector. So we play d- different defense. And like I had w- one guy that was older, ex-NBA player, Ratko Varda, he was really good and high flat, you know, so we were doing that. So in my coaching career, I did many things and I know what is my personal favorite, but I couldn't do it, do this every time. And I say, okay, if I cannot, then let's switch it. Yeah. Good for you. And uh, I, I want to dive a little deeper since we have your expertise into some of those rebounding points you made, because I just like to get a little bit more insight. So you mentioned again, how to initiate contact to keep a would-be rebounder grounded. You talked about that in terms of a loony strength. So how, what are you teaching specifically? How are we teaching that? And how are we developing that for a player? Uh, first, it's really important that you start fighting for the, for the position the moment the, the ball is shooting. So like the, the moment the ball leave hand of a shooter, you start fighting for the position. And then the, depending, are you in offense and, and defense, it's what you're doing. Like offensively, you try to go around the defense and to, to, to depend where defense is. Like sometimes if defense is too low under the basket, you try to push the defense underneath the rim, that ball bounce over them. And if they box you out higher, then you try to go around them. Like 
you don't need to push a guy to move it. There are so many strong guys and you cannot be the strongest guy in the league like Shaq and move everybody else. Like, yeah, so okay, you have to outsmart them. So like when they want to box you out and especially the old school boxing out is easily to, to go around. And, you know, we're trying to do that. So and you talked about, um, you know, basically you're saying moving while everyone else is watching, I think is how you phrase it, right? Yes. And uh, that that anticipation, that perception. So that's developed, obviously, through physical practice, but also through film study. And I imagine now data, does data in the NBA basically tell a player like Looney where they should go most of the time? Uh it's not that I was telling him where he should, where he should yeah, go. Okay, but, fair you know, enough. Your experience, is, but it's yes, my experience. Like and, and like, there is like seventy-five percent when some the ball is shooting from one side that is going to bounce on the other side. Like there is there that is data, and and then it's a just simple adjustment to where you are. It's how much spacing you cover. Like if you are too low in a corner. Yes, you are on the opposite side, but you're going to cover the smaller area. Like then you are, uh, imagine there's a line when it's a slot and then the slot when you draw a line to the basket. And now if this semicircle, if you stay here, it's it's a area where you cover the most. So, so m- m- most bounces. A- and if you try to go there as much as you can, is, is the chance of your getting ball, it's high. And plus like uh, you can try to predict anything, but the ball bounce on, on the opposite side. But the point is, if you go and try to grab any possible rebound, any, so without hustle, it's not doable. Like, you have to try to go any, because you just go and many times, ball just bounce to your to, to your hands because you were trying. If you try to go, you, you improve your chances of getting the ball. Yeah, I'm glad you said in the absence of effort, none of this matters to a certain extent. Exactly. But also connecting this back, what you've said many times in this podcast, do, decision making is the most important part beyond that, isn't it? Exactly. And, 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 and for me, it's funny when I hear that, oh, they say, oh, okay, like uh, rebounding is just effort. You go and take rebound. No, it's not. It's not like defense. So some people are saying, oh, defense is just a matter of effort. No, it's not. You have to know to play defense. You know, great defensive players are really smart players and they know how to anticipate things, how to move before the primary, to move on a help side. Because if you are moved properly on a help side, you're going to be easy, you're going to play defense easier when the ball comes on a strong side. So if you are just stick to your guy and you don't move and then you try to help, you're going to be late. So, you know, you have to move and predict what what is going to happen on the court. And if you are not smart, it's hard to do that. Basketball IQ matters. Definitely matters. And, uh, you know, you clearly have a great IQ coach and great uh, feel for coaching. So I'm wondering then, you as an established head coach, an experienced coach, both player development, coaching, however you want to describe it, joining an organization like Golden State that's established and has some established superstars, what were some challenges possibly for you initially in terms of becoming a part of that system? First challenge was I was never assistant. <laughs> I, was, I was head coach. That's a big one, isn't it? <laughs> oh, it's a big one. I was assistant uh, in national team to Igor Kokoshko. And, yeah. and, you know, it helped me. Igor is a great guy and he's an NBA coach. And it helped me. But the, the point is why, why from head coaching I went to assistant is uh, I wanted to work on the best possible level. Like, you know, and... and there is a chance to work with, you know, Steve Kerr, who is one of the best coaches ever and, and, you know, great, awesome person. So, you know, all together, I got an offer. And for me, you know, it was, you know, really, uh, you know, at, at a split of second made decision. Okay, I'm, I'm going to go there. I want, I want to be part of this organization to be assistant of, of Steve Kerr and, you know, to help as much as much as I can. And, I really enjoy my job. I, I, I'm, you know, really satisfied in the role that I have in the team. Uh, and, you know, I'm not thinking getting back to Europe soon. I wouldn't think I wouldn't be either. <laughs> <laughs> we don't have to get into European coaching, but obviously it's <laughs> tremendous opportunities, but there's tremendous challenges in Europe, I know as well. Um, it, it is. I mean, you know, like coaching in Europe is beautiful. And I had really nice jobs. And my approach is I was never... 
I'm going to give my best and whatever happened, happened. Like I was never afraid, you know, getting fired and whatever. Like this is the part of coaching. And probably because I never afraid of getting fired. I never got fired. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so, and look, probably in the future, I don't know almost any coach that uh, didn't got fired in some moment. Probably I'm going to get fired also, but I'm not afraid. You know, the, my point is I'm going to give my best, you know, and, and not just best, you know, uh, working hard. No, the, the coaching is all together. How you behave, how you, you treat players, uh, your, your colleagues, you know, coaches, people from organization, uh, you know, all it's all together. And when I say I give my best, I'm thinking about all. That's great. I love that philosophy. Yeah. What lessons from having worked with Jokic and seeing him develop over this career that he's had, which is remarkable, what lessons during his development can be applied to others in player development? Uh, to be honest, Jokic is not a great example for that because mm. it's so easy coaching him. So mm. like, I, I've learned more from other players than Jokic because you, whatever you show Jokic, he's doing so, so you know when when you're dealing with things that are not working this is what makes you think harder and and, and work harder i told you what what jokic uh hurdle was that that he didn't want to do things that he's not competing uh in and and that's what he he made me uh you know to make all my drills competitive but if we talk about development his development was super easy and, and I'm trying to forget Jokic in my future development because 99% of the players, they cannot do that and pick up so easily like Nikola did. So like, okay, let's try to figure out how we're going to help a player when, when he's struggling. And that's what makes me, what made me uh, uh, better in development and better in coaching. Like, I think that if you don't have bad seasons as a head coach, you cannot improve. Maybe it sounds weird, but bad seasons make you think more harder than than than, than the good seasons. Well, the struggles make you work harder, and you have to fight for your learning, don't you? And you have to fight for your success. You just analyze more. Like when you say work harder, I try to work harder all the time. But it, it's a given, isn't it? You're going to work hard. A coach is going to work hard. Yeah, yes, but you know, like you you don't analyze as much because you don't have to. Things are working. <laughs> So, but when things are not working, and then you start really analyzing, okay, let's see why they're not working. Because when you analyze things that are working, you say, okay, we're, we're working because you know they're doing this, this, this. So we, you know, uh, d- we do this, you know, to to, to uh, beat the the idea of defense that or offense that, that doesn't matter. But if they're doing something that make your offense or defense struggle, then then it's you know really hurdle that you have to overcome and, and you have to think more. So maybe it sounds weird, but I equally love my bad seasons like my good seasons. I got to love it all as a coach, doesn't it? And I imagine that perspective helps you keep keep yourself a lot more balanced in your whole life, doesn't it? Yes, that's true. And you appreciate more good things when you have bad things. If you don't have it, you don't appreciate it not as much. I loved that connection that you made. Like It's easy to ask questions about Jokic. But really, I mean, again, so much of your success has not come from coaching him, but from coaching all the other players and all the players that, as you said, were a little bit harder to coach to get to the level they were at. That's just tremendous perspective for all of us to reflect on as coaches. Yeah, like the big players, it's it's easy to coach. And it's easy and not easy. Like, you know, some people say, oh, okay, if you have a great team, then it's easy to coach. No, uh, you have to make them being great team if you have great individuals you have to figure out their roles because if they're not satisfied with the roles that they have then they're going to struggle and then if you're winning at the moment the things will work but the first bad stretch uh, when, when come the first bad stretch then the you know the chemistry is destroyed inside and then the real problems start to start to you know going out so that's, I think the coaching is really important, even more than people think, uh, but not in a way that people think. Like coach is not like, I, I, I was telling this all the time. For me, coaching is, 30% of coaching for me is axox, like, you know, sets and, and rules and everything, not more than 30%. <laughs> and then like 
30% is your relationship with the players and the roles that you give to the players. Because if you don't make good chemistry in a team, if you don't set good roles in a team, then you're going to struggle. It doesn't matter if you are good and excellent O's, you're going to struggle because of this. And the third part is your relationship with the management and that management front office supporting you in the goals. Like if, if you think in one way and you have one goals and that doesn't fit with the, the front office goals, you're going to struggle. So like you have, and then 10% is everything else, all other relationships. But the point is, if you don't have two out of three, you're going to struggle. If you miss one, you want to work good. But you know, if you miss two, then there is a problem. <laughs> I know really good, really good coaches with great X and O's, like brilliant minds, but they struggle in those things that are like, you know, relationship with the players, relationship with the front office, and they struggle. doesn't matter that they are good in X and O's. A great perspective. And uh, man, coach, this is such a fun conversation. Thank you so much for sharing with us. I really enjoyed talking basketball and, uh, you know, just amazing to be able to share the game with you. Thanks. Thanks. It was really fun for me also.